All right, hello students. Thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is a presentation called Close Reading The Company of Wolves, uh, where I'll be looking at a few sections from the short story The Company of Wolves by Angela Carter and doing a kind of detailed reading of them, asking questions, seeing what sort of ideas we can generate as a way of showing how the close focus on the details in a small portion of language within a story can help us to unfold, unpack um, all sorts of ideas and see how on the sentence level the story is working in a similar way to how it's working on the global level, so to speak. So let's jump right in. Let's talk about the title, The Company of Wolves. What would it be like to be in The Company of Wolves? That is, what would The Company of Wolves be like? And why is it a, a strange word to use? company because normally when we talk about someone's company it means to be comforted by them oh i want someone's company to have someone around so you don't feel lonely to be in someone's company is a pleasant thing uh, we can also think about company as a unit a unit a corporation a company is a group of people so the company of wolves um, the group of wolves what is it that they do who are they the story begins, one beast and only one howls in the woods by night. So it talks about a beast. And when we hear that word beast, what ideas are evoked in your mind? What traits and ideas are associated with it? And notice the way it's emphasized one beast and only one, right? Not just the werewolf howls in the woods by night or one beast howls in the woods, but one beast and only one, emphasizing the uniqueness of this wolf. And why don't you think the narrator gives the wolf a name? Why do they call it a beast rather than the werewolf or a werewolf or even just a wolf? What is What effect is served by just calling it a beast, leaving it nameless? And for those of you who'd like to hear a howling wolf, well, listen to the great play guitar player howling wolf. Click the link below to find yourself listening to some great blues. All right, next slide. The wolf is carnivore incarnate, and he's as cunning as he is ferocious. So that phrase, carnivore incarnate, what does that mean, literally? And why is it notable or strange? Well, carnivore meets one that means one that eats meat. Carnivore eats meat. Incarnate means in the flesh. So, for example, in Christianity, Jesus is God incarnate. It's the God in the flesh. So the wolf is the flesh eater in the flesh. It's the fleshy being, the being of life that eats life. And he's as cunning as he is ferocious. So what does that tell us about the wolf, about his characteristics and about what he desires? Once he's had a taste of flesh then nothing else will do. So what does this tell us about his appetite and about his desires? They're out of control almost. It's almost like an addiction. Once they've had the taste of blood, the wolf wants to keep consuming. And what is the idea of appetite or taste of flesh? Does it evoke any other associations? The general theme of eating or consumption or desire for flesh. What other concepts or ideas might this relate to or might it imply? At night, the eyes of the wolves, the eyes of wolves shine like candle flames, yellowish, reddish. So what detail about the setting is repeated and emphasized? Well, again, that it's at night, right? The night time. What do the eyes of the wolf look like when you imagine them based on this description? Yellowish, reddish. What, what do those colors evoke for you? What does the idea of candlelight evoke for you? And how might it be sort of ironically deployed here in talking about the wolf's eyes that are shining like candle flames? But that is because the pupils of their eyes fatten on darkness. That description description of the eyes fattening. So what are the eyes doing? The pupils are almost eating the darkness and becoming fatter, becoming fleshier, just as the wolf wants to eat human flesh. And again, what detail about the setting is repeated and emphasized? The darkness, 
that we've got light in dark. And their eyes catch the light from your lantern to flash it back to you, red for danger. So what action happens here? And what might be meaningful about that action? The light flashing from our lanterns back to us from the wolf. So the wolf is reflecting the light back in some way. How is the wolf a reflection of something about humanity? And what is notice noticeable or notable about the way the narrator tells the story here? It doesn't say catches the light from one's lantern, but catches the light from your lantern, as though we are part of the story, as though we are in this world, as though this is a warning, red for danger. If you see red eyes flashing back to you, beware. And if a wolf's eyes reflect only moonlight, then they gleam a cold and unnatural green, a mineral, a piercing color. So there's something unnatural about the light of these wolves about their eyes, something unnatural about the wolves themselves, and their eyes pierce into you in the same way that their teeth pierce through your flesh. You are always in danger in the forest where no people are. So again, what's unusual about the way the narrator relates the story? You are always in danger, not the people are always in danger but you are always in danger in the forest. And the sense of being always in danger, again, like a warning, you are in danger that the narrator is telling us. Why are we in danger? We, the readers, aren't we safe on our side of the story? What about this story might be dangerous? What about reading is like entering a forest? And there are no other people in this story. There's only us, there's only our minds, our imagination. And what's notable about the forest, what's meaningful about this detail? Well, it's a place absent human power, absent human presence. There's something dangerous about it. There's something inhuman about the forest, which is why it's so dangerous. Step between the portals of the great pines where the shaggy branches tangle about you. So what metaphor is used to describe the trees? They're called a portal the portal of the great pines. Well, what is meaningful about calling the, the entrance to the forest like a portal? Well, where does a portal take you? Someplace else, someplace different. So we're crossing over a boundary here from one place to the next. And the shaggy branches tangle about you. Who is performing those actions? Well, it's as if the, the trees are coming alive, the branches are acting on you. And of course, we think of trees as passive, as static. But here, they're shaggy. It's almost like they have hair on them. Right? They're almost living beings. Well, they are living beings, but they're almost like animals that are capturing you as you enter the forest. And the trees, the, the branches are trapping the unwary traveler in nets as if the vegetation itself were in a plot with the wolves who live there. So what actions are being per performed and by whom? Right? The vegetation is trapping the unwary traveler. The plants are acting. They're doing things as if the vegetation were in a plot. What's the significance of that phrase, as if? Well, it signals to us that this isn't what's really happening. Something's happening when the, when the branches tangle around you. They're not really trapping you, but it's as if the vegetation were in a plot. So from whose perspective is it that the vegetation is in a plot? Well, our perspective, that is, you, the person walking through the forest, who then feels the branches tangling around you, it feels like they're being captured. It feels like the whole world of nature is turning against you and the wolves and the trees are all in a plot to capture you. As though the wicked trees go fishing on behalf of their friends. So it's a repetition as though they were in league, as though they were in a plot, as though they're going fishing on behalf of their friends. So what's the effect of repeating that imaginary idea? Again, we know, quote unquote, that the trees aren't really doing this, but the imagination that they're doing something, the idea that they're doing something keep, keeps coming back. And how do the images in this phrase relate to earlier images in the passage in what we've read so far? 
right? Go fishing. They're fishing. We are the bait or we are the fish rather. We are the, the hunted, the prey. Step between the gateposts of the forest with the greatest trepidation and infinite precautions. So repetition of the narrator telling us, step into the forest, go into the forest. And where they were first portals, we have that metaphor repeated. Now they are gateposts, right? And what do you do with a gatepost? What does a gatepost mark? It marks the division between one space and another, between the human world and the natural world. And what is the narrator's tone or attitude towards us as audience, right? Again, talking to us directly, not talking about the people in the town who step between the gate posts of the forest, but you do it. And it's telling us to do it with the greatest trepidation and infinite precautions. Be wary. Watch out. Beware of what's happening. Pay attention when you go into someplace new and strange, like, for example, the new world of a new story. For if you stray from the path for one instant, the wolves will eat you. Well, what associations or memories, remembrances does this evoke? Who else is warned not to leave the path? Who tells you not to leave the path? All right, we might think of the Red Riding Hood story. So we're being warned just as the mother warns little Red Riding Hood, don't eat the path. Or don't leave the path or else you'll be eaten. Certainly don't eat the path, but don't leave the path or you'll be eaten. So we're put in the place of the child of, we're put in Little Red Riding Hood's place for a moment. The, the mother's child, the child of the narrator. They are gray as famine. They are as unkind as plague. So look at these two similes, two comparisons. The wolf is compared to famine and plague which are two of the harbingers of the apocalypse. But also, comparing the wolf to famine, and wolves are often associated with famine, with starvation, it sort of humanizes them almost, or at least makes them a little bit sympathetic, because why is it that the wolves must eat and hunt? Because they need to survive, right? But Notice the, the biblical images and how powerful these images are. Gray as famine, unkind as plague, making the wolves beyond the natural, the supernatural. They are somehow associated with the ultimate powers of life and death. Skipping forward to the next section, a few pages in, let's look at page 215. And here is our first description of our Little Red Riding Hood character. She stands and moves within the invisible pentacle of her own virginity. So this is clearly a figurative description. I mean, I'm telling you, look up pentacle and decide if it's literal or figurative, but she's moving within the pentacle of her own virginity, right? She's being constrained by, or she's trapped within, or not necessarily trapped, but she is remaining within the world of her virgin life. And look up pentacle and, and see what a pentacle is. Look at the different meanings of pentacle and what does it mean that it's invisible, that she's moving within these invisible boundaries defined by what? Her virginity. And of course we might think, what really is virginity? It's mostly a social convention. What associations or values do we have with virginity and specifically with female virginity, right? And what does that say about our society and the way we view the roles of women and men? Female virginity is often considered something very important. A woman, a woman losing her virginity, right? We tell young girls to wait until something special, wait until it's special, wait until you find the right person. And a woman who loses her virginity traditionally has been seen as especially in more traditional cultures, as somehow less, somehow inferior. She's lost her value. She's damaged goods. You might have heard that phrase. So what presumptions are behind the values attributed to female virginity? It tends to objectify women, seeing in them as objects with a certain worth. And paradoxically, what is it that makes a woman worthwhile in this economy is her virginity. That's what makes a woman desirable but it's the virginity that the man is then going to consume. So what happens to the woman once she's lost her virginity? Even in marriage, there's a certain sense that 
there's a loss of value there. So what I'm pointing out here is that virginity as an ideology objectifies women and it places certain values and controls and restrictions on women's sexuality for the benefit of, for the power of, for the pleasure of male consumption. She is an unbroken egg, the narrator describes her. Why an egg? What does an egg do? Well, an egg houses within it the fetus that's going to become an adult. So she is an egg. So there's something about her that has not been born yet, right? She still needs to break out of her shell, we might say, figuratively speaking, the shell of her virginity, perhaps. And given that we're talking about sexual maturation, is the image of an egg more meaningful within the context of her virginity? She is an unbroken egg, and yet she also, of course, contains within her ovaries or eggs. What associations or images does an egg evoke in your mind? And what does it mean that it's unbroken? What does that suggest about what will happen in her future? And is there a paradox in the sense that one has to break the egg, right? Something has to be broken in order to move into the future and move into maturity. She is a sealed vessel. What purpose does a vessel serve? What do you use a vessel for? Well, if we think about a vessel as a ship, it carries something from one place to another. A vessel is for storage. So in what way is she like a vessel within the context of her virginity? What is she the vessel for? The vessel for future life, right? The vessel for future humans. But does that reduce her? Does that make her just a baby factory, so to speak? Is she more than a vessel? Is she more than just a mechanism for producing children? And again, thinking about she's sealed, she's unbroken, what does calling her a sealed vessel imply about what will happen? And we can think about illusions, you might think, uh, what's uh, stories that are related to this? What can I even think of a famous story of a woman and a sealed vessel that is opened up? The story perhaps of Pandora and Pandora's box, might that be in some way a context for this story? Think about it, something to consider. She has inside her a magic space. So how is that description different from calling her an unbroken egg and a sealed vessel? How does it change the way we view her? How does it change our understanding of what her life is about, what her purpose is, how we think about her. It makes her, I think, a little bit more powerful. The space is magical. It's not just a vessel. It's not just an egg, but there's something powerful that she has within her. So it makes this perhaps makes her more than just a baby factory. The entrance to which the entrance to the magic space is shut tight with a plug of membrane the hymen talking about physically. So what does this description suggest about the nature of the girl and her interior magic space? What is it shut for? It's shut as a sort of protection, perhaps. But also in order for the magic to be released, the entrance needs to be opened. She needs to open herself up physically, emotionally to the outside world, move beyond that state of virginity that constrains her. We can think about this idea of entrances, exits, places that are open or closed. Remember when we think about the forest and the forest as a space of danger that one enters, but one in some sense must enter. You have to pass through the forest. She is a closed system. Well, let's think about a system. What do we mean when we say something is a system, right? That means it's a circulating, a uh, set of forces and energies and objects that are connected in one in some way to one another, something harmonious about the way they interact. And in what way is she a system or is any human being a system? We can think about our bodies and all the different things that are going on within them, right? The digestion and the neurons firing and blood pumping back and forth and nutrients being carried and recycled, waste, food being taken in, processed, digested, and waste excreted, right? Our body is like a system. And now if she has a closed system, what does that mean? It means nothing's coming in or out. It's closed off. There's a certain stagnancy there, perhaps. 
she's clothed literally in that she is a virgin, right? She is not, her body, her system has not been opened up to another body. And she's figuratively clothed as a young girl who has yet to emerge into society, who has yet to engage with other people. She does not know how to shiver. Now, do you think that is literal or figurative? I would say figurative. Literally, she knows how to shiver. Shivering is not something that you learn one way or the other. Shivering is a natural reaction. But why do you shiver? Well, you shiver out of coldness. You shiver out of fright. And so what does this tell us about the girl's personality? That she does not know how to shiver. Does she not experience the cold? Does she not experience fear? And is that a good or a bad thing? Why might she not experience fear? One, because she's very brave. And another reason why someone might not experience fear, because they're very naive. They don't know that they're supposed to be afraid of things just yet. She has her knife. Again, what does this tell us about her personality and her life? What does it tell us about who she is? She's armed. This is a literal detail, but it's also figurative as well. She is more than just a girl. She's more than a stereotypical, innocent, weak little girl. She has a certain power about her. And what associations or references, symbolic references, might be evoked by the knife? Well, we associate knife, uh, the knife we can think about as a phallic symbol, something associated with masculinity, maleness. It's something that cuts, something that penetrates. But she has hold of it. She has a certain power. She's not, again, the meek, stereotypical, mild girl of the Little Red Riding Hood stories. And she is afraid of nothing. So again, what does this tell us about her? And is this a good trait to have? Being afraid of nothing. Should you be afraid of some things? Is it good to have a certain amount of fear? And if you don't have fear, what might happen to you? What might you do? You might perhaps rush into something that is way too dangerous for you to handle. Telling us that she's afraid of nothing, does this set up any expectations for what will happen in the rest of the story? And what are those expectations? Well, for me, it tells us something is going to happen that maybe should make her afraid. She's going to be challenged in her confidence. She's going to experience something possibly dangerous, possibly something that will make her afraid. Now let's skip ahead again to the very end of the story, page 219. This is the, the climax where the girl conquers the wolf. She will lay his, faith, his fearful head on her lap. Now what tense is the verb, she will lay? That is, when does the action happen? Does it happen in the past, the present, or the future, according to the narrator's description? And why is that significant? It's happening in the future. It's not saying she did lay his fearful head on her lap. And it's not saying she is laying his fearful head on her lap. It's saying she will in the future. This is what will happen. She will lay his fearful head on her lap. And notice that we had just talked about her not being afraid. And now the wolf, which is the violent monster that we've been warned about since the beginning of the story, the wolf is the one that is fearful. And what is paradoxical or strange about the image? What does it suggest about what has happened in the plot, how the characters have changed, and so forth? We would expect she would be the one who's afraid, and the wolf would be the one in control. But it's the other way around. Something is switched. The dynamic of the weak woman and the powerful male monstrosity that is the wolf, their positions have been changed. And what associations or other images does her action evoke in your mind? Who lays someone else's head in their lap, right? A mother with the child's head laying in its lap. Or a lover with their other lover laying, in its, laying their head in his lap. I'm reminded of a moment from Hamlet where Hamlet says to Ophelia, may I lay in your lap? And she says, no, my lord, because, of course, laying in her lap means sexual. And he says, I mean my head in your lap. And she says, I, my lord. Oh, okay, you just meant you're going to lay your head down in my lap. 
and he goes, did you think that I meant country matters? With a certain emphasis on the first syllable of the word country. What kind of matters, what country matters what might a man be referring to when he talks about laying his head between a, a maiden's lap? Sexuality, obviously. So there's a sexual overtone here made quite explicit in the language. And she will pick out the lice from his pelt and perhaps she will put the lice into her mouth and eat them. Okay, so this is clearly disgusting from our perspective, from a civilized human perspective, but can we imagine another perspective to imagine this action? That is, what does it mean not to us, but to them? When one animal picks the lice from another animal, what are they showing? What are they showing about their relationship to that other creature? Why is she doing this, given their situation and history? How might he interpret it? What is she telling him? It's an act of love. Also an act of power in some sense, but an act of love that she is grooming him. She is showing him that she is like him in some sense, a human and an animal. And there's some bond between them made through this very intimate, and again, grotesque and disgusting from our perspective, but from an animal's perspective, a beautiful and loving action. As he will bid her, as she would do in a savage marriage ceremony. So he is asking her to eat the, the lice. So does it seem out of strange, does it seem strange or out of place, this action, that he is bidding her to do this? given that she seems to be the one in power. What do we see about the dynamics between them? And this, this, this image that it's a savage marriage ceremony, is that paradoxical? Is that something of an oxymoron? Do we think about savagery and marriage as being compatible with one another? And if they're not, what makes them compatible in this, in this story? How is it that the savage world and the human world are brought together? The final, some of the final lines of the story, the blizzard will die down, the blizzard died down. Interesting, two lines, one right after another, one saying it will happen in the future and the other saying it has happened in the past. So what changed in the verb tense? We're going from future tense to past. And what has happened in those sentence, in between those two sentences? And why does the author choose to put us in this sort of odd situation relative to the time scheme. Things are never quite happening in the moment. We're always watching things that are about to happen or things that have just happened. What is the effect that that creates for us in terms of how we read and how we experience this story? So let's just uh, wrap up. I'll talk about just a few of the ideas that we've generated and, and uh, found through this close reading. Um, one is a theme of borders and crossings, right? The forest as a border and the gateposts to the forest, crossing into the forest from the human world to the natural world. The werewolf itself as a crossover, as a human that becomes an animal, an animal that becomes a human. And the, the girl herself moving from being a virgin child to an adult woman, to an adult married woman, if we take the ceremony at the end as legally binding, that is. But so we see this theme of borders and crossings. And of course, there's also our crossing over of readers from our world into the fictional world of the story. The story is in itself, in some ways, about that crossing over, about what it means to read and the kinds of ways we open ourselves up to new experiences when reading. Another idea that we've seen is appetite. Right? The consumption of flesh, the wolf's desire for human flesh and blood that it must eat, that it keeps eating, and that it itself is being consumed by its own desire. When the wolf is described, it's described as scrawny and pathetic in a certain sense. The ribs throwing, showing through its skin because it's so skinny. So it eats constantly, yet it is also eaten away by its own appetite. And the wolf's um, appetite for flesh is symbolic of or modeled on an appetite for sex, in particular, a, a patriarchal or violent male desire for sex. And we can think about in the story how 
a certain form of masculine desire, male desire, is allied with violence. Not that male desire is necessarily violent, but the, the type that we're shown here, which is the desire, again, to consume, the desire for virgin flesh, and to keep consuming it more and more, is, con is connected with a type of violence against women. First against the grandmother, and then attempted but failed against the girl herself. And that's contrasted with female desire, her own desires that she's learning to explore, learning to discover in this story. She feels desire for the woodsman. She feels desire for the wolf, ultimately, and fulfills her own desire in a way that saves her, we might say, from the fate that is that her grandmother faces. And finally, just thinking about some patterns and opposition, some of these we've gone over already, but just some general patterns, dynamic back and forth that we see that the, the story is sort of written within these structures of the patterns of human versus animal, of the natural and savage world versus the civilized world, of male versus female, of light versus dark. And these things are not associated with one meaning or another. It's not that one side is good and the other side is bad. And light and dark, male and female, human and animal, they are not exact opposites. That is, they are involved with each other. There is something of the human in the animal. There's something of the animal in the human. There is something savage within civilization. There is something civilized within nature. So think about how these oppositions and see what other oppositions you can find in the story, how they bounce off one another, how they interact how they shape the overall reception that we have and the ideas that we generate from the story. So finally, what other themes, ideas, images, what other patterns do you see repeated throughout the story? And think about how this story builds on and differs from what Angela Carter did in The Werewolf, both taking the, the Little Red Riding Hood story and modifying it, making it rather strange, we might say, updating it for a modern world, but what do they do differently? What's different about the kinds of stories? If they're both stories in some way about maturation, about coming of age, what are the different processes that happen? What are the different dangers that we see in each story? So that's it for this uh, presentation on The Company of Wolves. Um, if you have any questions, of course, contact me. I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next video.